What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Couple Things. With Sean and Andrew. A podcast all about couples. And the things they go through. Today is a fun one. That's right. I feel like I feel like we're kind of very similar couples. We are. Deval and Kadeen Ellis. Yes. Just came out with a book, by the way. It's called We Over Me. But Deval played in the NFL. Mm-hmm. Better athlete than I was. Safe to say. Had a better career than I did. But they now are full-time YouTubers. Yes. They create and content. They're hilarious. They create content about their family, about their relationship. They have a podcast kind of on relationships. They have gone through a lot of the same stuff, dealt with a lot of the same issues. But I do feel like they're a couple years ahead of us with some wisdom that we really loved being able to take away. Also, their delivery is different <laughs> than ours as well, which leads to a lot of laughs in this episode. Just get ready. It, <laughs> it's fantastic. Just get ready. Uh, Anything we wouldn't say, they will. For us, which is great. Yeah, it is great. We'll link their podcast as well as their book down below and their social handles. Congratulations on the book release, The Val and Kadeen. And I would like to interview them again. Me too. This was fun. We hope you enjoy it. Without further ado, The Val and Kadeen Ellis. The Val, Kadeen, it, it's a pleasure to be talking to you. You're staying busy. You got the book released. Was it this week? No, no, no. It releases... Um, February 7th, February 7th, actually. yeah. Uh-huh. I was watching your, your uh, intro trailer on your YouTube channel. Hilarious. It was, it was hilarious. <laughs> thank you, thank you. you had me with the, with the, with the stand-up comment. The oh book always God. stands up. Oh, like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it always stands up for us. We got, <laughs> really, really, really. Clearly, uh, really. the proof is in the, you know? the house that we have full of kids. So, yeah. <laughs> so, you got the book. You're doing a podcast tour. And... Yes simultaneously filming shows filming for youtube and raising four boys yes. oh yeah yes. oh yeah yes. four I, boys I, that, that's at the top of the list because that's typically where you know of course you know trying to juggle everything that's where the number one priority is like making sure that we're raising decent human beings at the end of the day <laughs> but usually whenever we're traveling and we're moving around and you know the kids aren't in tow with us it's always letting them know and reminding them that, yo, we're doing all of this stuff to build something for you guys. Like it's all ultimately about you guys and the legacy that we're trying to leave for these kids. So yeah, we're doing a lot of things, y'all. I'm just curious how you do four boys. We had our first boy. He's the one-year-old and he is wild. Boys are different. (laughs) Yes, they are. So four of them, how do you keep them alive? Bruh. Um, A lot of discipline. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, the fact is... (laughs) We had a five-year gap in between the first and the second mm-hmm. for that reason. Like, we were trying to figure it all out. Right. But then when we got it, we had the second one. And then the doctor lied to us and told us that we wouldn't get pregnant if she was ovul- if uh, she was breastfeeding. Breastfeeding? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So the I was shooting the club up. You know? <laughs> and There's then, still uh, a chance. Yeah, yeah, there's a chance. There's a chance. Because we got <laughs> yeah. back to back. We had two under two. We so. should have named him Chance now that I think about it. Because you sure as hell was taking a chance. That, that, that would, yeah, that would have been. That chance been Ellis? No. Oh, no. man. Right. That's Kaz, though, our third. <laughs> Kaz is our third. And then another four years later, we had Dakota. Yeah, I think we just kind of at this point, like our oldest, I don't know how it was for your first, but our first is like the truest leader. Like he is a nurturer. He is super responsible. He's like the biggest empath. He's like, he's so good. So it's almost as if like he's already started that that trend of like the oldest will take care of everyone else. So we just kind of like hope that everyone's alive at the end of the day. If they're making noise, it's good. If they're quiet, then it's a problem. (laughs) Yes. So you guys have been together 20 years, married 20 years. Uh, together 20 years married 12 Mm -hmm. amazing so you guys have been through so many different career changes together oh yeah yeah (laughs) yeah what well first how did you guys meet a lot of figuring it out over the years so we went to the same elementary school we'll start there right so i remember him like second third grade like type vibes right so i remember seeing him and being like oh you know he's cute but at that age no one's really like you know, getting together. She was clocking me from young. I was a young. <laughs> but I did always know, like, wow, he's, he's a good looking kid, you know? He ended up leaving that school because we attended the same school. Um, his sister and my sister still went to that school because it's one of those schools that went from like kindergarten to eighth grade. So there's like the, the pipeline of children just kept going through yeah. the system. Um, and I would see him sometimes in the summer. It's literally like our paths kept crossing our entire lives until finally. We went to um, rival high schools. I was a football player. Yeah. She was a cheerleader. We whooped her. 
school's ass. It nice. was it was a lot going on. He was know? star football. Player. I yeah. did read this on your Wikipedia page. Sorry to to cut in here, but it said uh, in your high school career, you quote lit up the public school athletic league. Yes, you lit it up. Lit yeah, it up. Like, my senior year. The funny thing is, I only played football my junior and senior year because I was a basketball player. And I didn't play football until my junior year. And then once I figured it out, it was a wrap. My senior year, I had 26 catches for 831 yards and 15 touchdowns. Yeah. Like, who's counting? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, it's not like <laughs> I keep the stats. I don't. I, I just didn't <laughs> that. I'm estimating. Uh, you know, it's somewhere around there. But this um, is when the kids look him up now, and they're like, "Yo, Daddy was a beast, yo. Daddy but, was a beast." <laughs> but I was a beast, but I wasn't Odell Beckham Jr. Like my kids will remind me that I'm not OBJ every chance they get. Like that's it's just sad. that's what it is. <laughs> we were good, but not that good. Yeah, that's um, kids. So, kids gonna do that to you for sure. So when I graduated college, I was always a year older than him um, in schooling. So when I graduated college, the same school that we met at when we were kids was having a scholarship banquet. They usually have one every year. So that particular year, I had just won a national pageant and they asked me to come back to kind of help co-host the event. So when I looked at the list of honorees, I saw his name on there and I was like, shoot, like I'm actually going to get a chance to like possibly see him because we always, again, just saw each other in passing. It was never a chance for me to really connect with him. So I put That's out. That's what you gonna say? I pulled out. Time out. Time out. Stop. Stop. She's trying. She. Yo. She's leaving out some very important information. What? I used to work at Hagen Dazs. She used to go oh, to the I mall, did. walk by Hagen Dazs to did. see me, but never say anything. Like, <laughs> I did. I was like admiring from afar, and then so many times I'd be there with my friend or my cousin, and they'd be like, "Just go buy ice cream. Just like go buy ice cream, and it'll just break the ice." And I'm like, no. So finally, one day I had the gut, the guts to do it. And I got all cute, like, you know, one of those outfits that was definitely an Instagrammable moment. Mm-hmm. If there was Instagram back in the day, <laughs> hair done, everything. It's literally 2001. <laughs> and I, I, I get all dolled up to go to the mall to see him thinking for sure he was going to work. And he was off that day. Wow. Like, Dang. Bummer. But I knew he was going to be at the scholarship banquet. So I pulled out all the stops. I told my mom, I was like, listen, I need to wear a really nice dress. I have to make sure my hair is done. My makeup is done. And she's just like, all right, yeah, whatever, pageant girl. Little did she know that I was really about to shoot my shot with this one over here. Saw him at the banquet. Him and his brother were in the distance. If there was like a song playing in my head at the time, I don't even know what would have been playing, but it would have been some real like girl from Ipanema as I like walked over to him. I was singing like that saxophone. Yes, 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 I had to bag him because he didn't ask for my phone number as we were at the valet station about to leave. I was like, we did not just put it off all night and you're not going to ask him for my phone number, bro. So I took his program booklet out of his hand. I wrote my name and phone number and I was like, you should really use that. So can I at any point in here tell my perspective of the story? Size, you just story and the story. <laughs> so she walks up, she says, the Val and Brian Ellis. And my first instinct was like, damn. She was, she looked good. She, I was like, oh my, I was like, how she know my name, right? <laughs> but I was like, Val, be cool. You know, I'm 18. Testosterone is through the roof. You know, I'm still trying to be cool, but I'm nervous though, because she's a, a beauty queen, literally. Like she has on a, a sash and a freaking crown. So I'm nervous. I'm not going to lie. I'm nervous. So I'm like, yeah, that's my name. What's up? What's your name? <laughs> that's, in my, in my head, that's what my voice sounded like. I'm pretty sure it didn't sound nothing like that no, at all. Definitely. So that she said her name was Kadeem. We spent the whole time talking. It was a it was a banquet. No 18-year-old kid wants to be at a banquet. So mm-hmm. I was following her everywhere she went just to see, you know, what's up. So my Uncle Kevin, shout out to my Uncle Kevin, he always had mad chicks his whole life. Like, <laughs> And he used to get I'm sorry on Chadi, but it's the truth. Oh. Sorry, sorry, oh. the truth. Look, but before, oh, yeah. before they got married, Uncle Kevin was a gallus. Like he always had girls. <laughs> gallus is a Jamaican term for, you know, he was in these streets. She was in the streets with these <laughs> Yes. He with so, these thank you. <laughs> yes, to explain that. Yes. So I always looked to him as far as how I was gonna approach women. And he always explained to me, like, yo, you can't just rush into it and be all in their face. You gotta let them kind of think that they're not gonna get it. Before before I could even let her think that she wasn't gonna get the number ass, she grabbed my program and was like, 
in her Brooklyn way, since she ain't gonna ask me for my number, I guess I'm gonna put it in your book. <laughs> I was like, like, damn, like, you ain't even let me do that. My pageant pageant girl Midwest uh, vernacular and tone went out out the window. window. Like, I was just like, so you're not going to ask me for my phone number? Like, so she put it in there and then proceeded to curb me for the whole summer. It wasn't curbing. I was super busy that summer because I was doing a lot of traveling. I had just won that pageant title. So I was doing a lot of community service work. Mm -hmm. I was literally like traveling a lot. So as much as I wanted to hang with him, you know, the opportunity didn't present itself until I had a charity event at Hofstra University that he was attending. And I was like, oh shit. When my pageant director called and said Hofstra, I was like, this is going to be my moment to like rekindle uh-huh. like light bulb moment again uh-huh. and it was at the light the night walk october 3rd 2002 we'll never forget the wow. day um, that's when after the charity event we linked up um and he bagged me in this sense because it kind of sealed the deal yeah, um yeah, and in our yeah. book we talk about it it's i think it's called like um over a hero a bag of chips and a pickle or something like that because so, we went to get our meal i went to hofstra for that day Hofstra's not a big time football school you but you lit it up it's, I, I lit up Hofstra too over two <laughs> 400 receptions Touché. you know two thousand yards 21 touchdowns but who's counting <laughs> well, who's got <counting>? nobody <laughs> she comes she comes and i'm like how can i impress this girl so i had a black 1989 lease, Nissan Maxima, and this was in 2002, so it was an old ass car. <laughs> but I had Got black the job done. With chrome lip. I had the, the 18 inch subwoofer in the back, so I was blasting my music. So I pull up, roll the window down. <laughs> so in, in my mind, that's what my <laughs> pretty sure it didn't sound like that. <laughs> But then uh, she got in the car. She had on these tan, like, pants. She was just looking great. Oh, and, you remember my baby? Yeah, tan yeah, pants. She got on a black shirt. Her hair was up. This is the first time I seen her. Her hair was up in a bun in at the banquet. Yes. When she came, her hair was all the way down to her lower back. I was like, oh, <laughs> oh my God. So I had to change the look up on him. Yeah. So I had to get the uh, stamp of approval from my teammates. All the freshmen at Hofstra the same time I was there. It was Bo, Reef. Pitt and who they else? don't know these people. Oh, they don't know. Yeah, you don't know. I don't know Bo Reef and, and Kit, but <laughs> they sound like those guys. So I walk her through the calf, right? And I walk her first, and I'm just like, go ahead, baby, go ahead and go grab a seat, right? And as she's walking, <laughs> that's what that's what my voice sounds like in my head. As she's walking in front of me, I'm behind her looking at my boys like <laughs> <laughs> And they all like they doing like gyrations and stuff like I'm like, oh my god. And if she looked behind me, I'm like, <laughs> so, this is when I sealed. This is when I knew I was I was balling. I said, yo, you go to the cab, you get whatever you want. Mm-hmm. I, I had meal, meal points, way. baby. <laughs> I had meal points. I was like, baby, whatever you like, just go throw Wine it in the bag. <laughs> just Listen, throw it is, in the bag. This is before the Nobu days, okay? It was the uh-huh. meal card for sure. And, then, and we uh, got a hero at the, the cab. The hero the cab. Went back to his room, sat on his bed. And, I devoured <laughs> that sandwich. Yo, I was so hungry. Andrew, let me tell you something, yo. <laughs> Talk to this me. This beauty queen sat on my bed, right? She sat on my bed and she was just like, she says, you want me? You know, you don't mind if I eat on your bed? You don't mind? And I was like, sure, go ahead. You can eat on my bed. She said, okay. I thought that she was going to, like, like break off her sandwich and bite. Like, you know, she was, she was like, okay. <laughs> I was like, I was like, have they, feed, have they fed you at all? Like, oh. Yeah, mayonnaise running down my She's like, no, you said, you said, you, 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 want, you, want, you, said, you play football? I was like, Wow. Yeah. You were in love. I was in love at that point. I was in love. And clearly I was so comfortable because I felt like, man, I'm just linking up with like an old friend. Do you know what I mean? Like not really thinking much of it. Knowing of course that I really, really liked him, but that just sealed the deal. That was the day that sealed the deal for us. And we've spoken every day since October 3rd, 2002. 2002. Every day. Every day. day. Even when we mad at each other, we're still talking every day. All right. So you have, you have this podcast, dead ass. Mm -hmm. Do the YouTube yes. channel. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, you get the merch right there. The merch, yeah. Your book you referenced earlier, "We Over Me." You you are clearly big proponents and fans of of marriage. Tell me why. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, I am um, being 
and athletes, a former NFL player, which, which was probably one of the most stressful things I've ever done in my life. I never felt alone. You know, from the time I was 18, when Kay and I decided that we were going to try to do life together, even at 18, we always made a plan with each other. Like her dreams became my dreams. My dreams became her dreams. She said she wanted to be in entertainment television. She wanted to be a makeup artist. We always made a plan to do it together. Mm. And it's easier in life to have a lifeline when you're stepping out to do something that no one else has really done, right? If you, if you go into the NFL, only 1% of people get a chance to play in the NFL. Only 1% of people get a chance to go actually do TV, and we were both trying to do something that only 1% of the population can get paid and do. And I always felt comfortable knowing that regardless, if I failed, if I stumbled, if I didn't make it, if I had to pivot, I had somebody here to do it with. And for me, it just made life so much easier because you hear so much about mental health these days and people feel alone. Depression is at an all-time high, especially after the pandemic. A lot of people were isolated and, and insulated and I felt like I feel like having a partner here to do life with just gives you an opportunity to see the world from a different perspective because you have another set of eyes. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's dope, babe. Um, for me, I think I was just always that person that knew if I didn't meet Deval when I met him, I probably would have been like a serial monogamous, right? Because I'm the kind of person that always, since I was a kid, just envisioned my wedding day. I envisioned um, what my husband would look like. I envisioned like so many things about having a life with someone mm -hmm. where some people just don't feel that way. There's some women that are like, yo, I never want to be married. Or some men it's like, I never want to be married. I never want to have children. And kudos to people who know that early on, yeah. but they save people out of the misery by just not even embarking on that, right? But with marriage for me, even though um, I come from a two-parent household where my parents were married, still are, without parents, parents still yeah. married, a lot of the examples I saw around me were married couples. Were they necessarily the happiest married couples? No. Not per se, no. but there was always that camaraderie and that togetherness and that unity that I always witnessed and I always craved that. So for me, I'm a proponent of marriage with this man. I may not be a proponent of marriage for everyone, oh, um, yes. but with this, <laughs> <laughs> with this guy, right, don't smudge my eyeliner. My bad. Yeah. Listen, my wing, my wing is taking flight, Sorry, baby. Man, I want to make sure Val. Val. Thank you. Yeah. He helped me put my eyelashes on. Like that's marriage, y'all. Like that's marriage. So I do put lashes on. I'm good at it does, too. He does. He does. But for me, it's just really about finding the right person. This, he's my best friend. And I, I, we never put the D word out there, divorce like that. But if, for whatever reason, Deval and I were never together for whatever reason. He would still be my best friend. Like, it's just, it's almost like a... a You're not going to tell him how you told me that the divorce is off the table? I'll tell him. She goes, Deval, if you ever think about divorce, I'll kill you. You understand me? <laughs> You're not going nowhere. I'm like, or okay. Less. Or I'm less. <laughs> But um, you know, sometimes at some points I've always wondered, like, is this codependency that we have even healthy, right? Because it's like, man, we've been together literally since we were 18 years old. And our moms used to always say, guys, you need to be individuals. Yeah, and, like, see yeah. what you like outside of each other and things like that. But I think the beauty in our marriage is that we've been able to give each other the latitude and the grace to grow and change mm -hmm. and support each other through yeah. it. And we were the ones fortunate enough to make it out to this side 20 years later still being able to feel the togetherness that we felt at 18, even though we've had so many changes occur. I love everything you just said. Oh my gosh. I feel like we are very similar in many ways because we do the same thing. Like we'd kill each other if we ever left each other. It's not an option. It's not on the table. Um, but I'm curious though. One of the reasons why we started our podcast was I got so fed up with the world painting pictures of relationships. Like unless they're perfect, you have to leave. And that's not true. That's not marriage. Marriage is really, really freaking hard. Um, and I can only imagine you guys have you guys have said in your book too that you've had the rocky road. You've gone up and down with financial struggles and like going through career changes. How in your marriage did you get through them? Get through those like horrible and like hard times and still have a strong marriage at the end of it? Yeah. Man, this we man, I I'm Sean. I'm gonna tell you. It sounds like the most cliche thing to say, right? But constant communication. We talk about everything. And part of the reason why our podcast is called Deadass is because we keep it deadass. That's a colloquial term, news by New Yorkers, which means 
real honest and in real time. So that's what that asked me. We talked about things in our podcast that people shamed us for on Twitter. And what made them even more upset is that we weren't ashamed that they were shaming us because we honestly don't give a fuck. Remember what you said, Sean, about getting tired of watching the world Mm -hmm. talk about marriage as this esoteric, perfect option that the only way you can stay married to somebody you love is if everything is perfect. We were like, no, we had issues with intimacy. We had issues with finances. We had issues with family. We had issues with where we were going to live. We had issues Mm -hmm. with career choices. But we sat down and said to each other, I don't like the way this maybe feels. Do you want to help me get through this or do you want to go separate ways? Mm -hmm. And when you say that to this generation, they're just like, oh, my God, why is he being so abrupt and in her face? I'm just telling you how I feel. Mm -hmm. And she has the same latitude to come at me the same way. Mm -hmm. She's like, yo, DeVal, I don't like the way you did that made me feel. I don't like that. How are we going to handle this moving forward? And being able to speak to my best friend, because let's be honest. I know both of y'all got best friends, right? Your best friend got a bug in their nose, you tell them. Your best friend breath stink, you tell them. They do something, y'all might even fight. But y'all, that's my best friend. But when it comes to your significant other, it's like, no, you're not supposed to have those interactions. And if you do, it's toxic and you run. No, we're humans. We can talk about everything. We talk about everything. And, and that's the what? only way we got through. For sure, Simon. And okay. you know what the beauty is in talking about everything? And we literally mean like everything. Um there's a choice that you give your spouse, mm-hmm. right? And Deval and I make up make a choice every day when we wake up to be here and to be together, mm-hmm. regardless of what's going on. So when I feel like my choice is taken away from me, then it becomes a problem, right? And the only way that we can even be on the level playing field to say, you know what, I know I'm in a space where I can decide to be here authentically and show up for you organically like I want to is if we talk about it. Mm-hmm. So literally that's been our saving grace. And we have kind of thrown away the the notion that the patriarchy and society has set up for us to, this is what a marriage should look like. The yeah. fastest way to fail at marriage is to try to tailor make your marriage to somebody else's or some other thing. Nice. Um, so we've learned that kind of early on and uh, we were struggling through it for years. And I think we finally hit a sweet spot around. That's the truth. That's, that's a good thing to, uh, that's a good thing to point out is that the first five years of our marriage, even though we were together eight years before that, was extremely rocky. Mm-hmm. And it was rocky because we had put standards on the other person according to what we saw before us, not necessarily what we wanted, right? Mm-hmm. So at the time I was in the NFL, I was like, well, everybody else's wife stays at home. Everybody else's wife cooks and cleans. Everybody else's wife does this. So that's what you got to do, Kay, because I'm in the NFL. That's what you got to do. Mm-hmm. And she hated it. She didn't want to be at home. She wanted to be on television. She wanted to have her own businesses. She wanted to make her own money. And it got to a point when I realized, like, I don't want her to be at home. Mm-hmm. I hated the fact that she was at home. And then when I got home, she'd be like, okay, so tell me about your day. And I'd be like, whoa, like, you don't have anything to bring to the table? And she's like, well, I was home all day. So no, I don't. Mm-hmm. And that's when I realized, like, I don't really want what everyone else is telling me I should have. How about I just go get what I want? And we both started to do that. And it took five years of marriage to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Like not five weeks, you know, we didn't go to a counseling session one time. We talked about it and we we fucked it up a lot. Like we just made mistakes and decided like, you know what? All right, my bad, I shouldn't have said that. Okay, let me, (laughs) let me try this again. And she gave me grace, I gave her grace. Uh, We both made selfish decisions early on in our marriage and we learned how to adapt to it and Mm -hmm. finally figured out a point that being of service to each other was the best way for us to stay happy and stay in love. It's so cool. I I feel like, you know, we're all in the YouTube scene and there's no shortage of like entrepreneurship gurus or like, you know, finance bros where they're like, all right, if you just wake up at 4 a.m., you jump in the cold bath and you... And you, and you do intermittent fasting like that's how you yeah. achieve self-actualization or wherever the thing is and i'm like i'm like no honestly i feel like marriage is the best refining tool for me like if, if i'm trying to make the best andrew possible i need to be the best husband possible because marriage bro it's like football it's like i know you used to return punts it's like you got to get some yeah. reps in and then over yes. like over the course of failing a lot of times you yes. finally figure it out we're like oh i need to it's it's really my fault. I need to do this, and and that will make the the problem better. Or the, the Dude, s- let me let me tell you, bro. You literally just sounded exactly like how I talk. <laughs> accountability, accountability for me 
is really what made me a better husband, but also made me just a better person. You know, like playing football, the eye in the sky don't lie. This is the eye in the sky. The- <laughs> People come out to me like, you know, you said this, you know, you did this. And I'll be like, then I got to be accountable. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I agree with you, yo. Failing over and over again and having someone hold you accountable just reminds you. Because even though you fail and the fact that they're still there mm-hmm. is that impetus to keep trying to be better. You know, so that's why I, marriage made me a better man. I'm not even, and that doesn't work for everybody. There's plenty of single men out there who are billionaires. So it doesn't work for everybody. But my personality, yours, Drew, I can tell it just works for us, you know? Yeah, and I had problems with the accountability part. So this whole, like, you know, um, <clears throat> the correlation that he makes to football all the time with, like, why he is the way he is and why he's so structured and so disciplined and why he's he can easily take criticism and critique. That was not easy for me. So I come from a, a household where I try to be, like, the model child. I was the oldest of three. You know, my parents are West Indian. So typically West Indian parents are very strict growing up. And I just never, I had a fear of doing things wrong. I always had a fear of speaking up for myself because I just rather be quiet, not ruffle any feathers. Yeah. And then when we first got, you know, together. And that we was you, Sean? Was it? See, yeah, a girl. So well, you are a gymnast, right, Sean? This yes. one, I feel like Perfect. there's. Like, if I wasn't perfect, I was like quiet and oh my gosh the similarities are crazy because you got beauty pageant and gymnastics both very subjective like you have to please everybody then you got football football then we got the youtube thing going on and anyway it's it's pretty fun so many similarities yeah Yeah, but i had a problem with that and that was a a huge hurdle for us um when we finally got married because i was just expecting when i got married like things were just supposed to flow like you know before you get married how many people really sit you down and say hey guys like this is what you should look out for here's some things you should do as a wife could eat and I'm like, nobody got to tell me. So we were just kind of figuring things out along the way. And it was a lot of um, tough times that we had because yeah. I was really trying to like pull certain things out of me. And I just didn't know how to effectively even communicate how I felt. So we've come a long way with that. And but I think in the most recent years. I, I didn't know. I didn't know how to communicate effectively either, though. Like it, it wasn't just on her. I didn't know how to co- effectively communicate. Pageant girl, everything had to be a 10. It had to be perfect, Right. But me, I'm a football guy. So my first thing is I'm trying to amp her up. Let's fucking go. Yeah. You can't say let's fucking go to your girlfriend. You're like, I was like, no fears. But but Why? you know, but you know, right? They say athletes are like mushrooms. They only grow if you shit on them and keep them in the dark. So I was like, I want my girlfriend to I know you like mushrooms, but you don't like the process of how a mushroom becomes a mushroom. No. So my biggest issue was I used to treat my girlfriend, now my wife. Like I used to treat my kids, I mentored. Like We're coaches like treated me, like I like guess. a teammate because which we are essentially. But no, I mean you are a teammate, but we we have to be honest, right? As people, the way athletes, especially football players, during the time that how old are you, Drew? Thirty one. No, thirty one. Oh, you're a little bit younger well, than me. I'm, I'm thirty. I'm thirty eight. I'm be thirty nine. So I'm almost a whole decade older. Than you. <laughs> but football was a little bit different, like. Football, they could call you names. They could call you sissy. They could hit you. They, they would do two or days every single day. And I felt like that type of pressure was what made me successful. So trying to put that type of pressure on the people around me to make them successful would just be, I just felt like that's how it was. Mm-hmm. So when I was doing that to her early in our relationship, in our marriage, I just saw her just shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And it wasn't until five years into our marriage that I realized like, yo, I can't. We talked about this in the book. I must give you a little tidbit. We found out that she was pregnant with, well, she found out she was pregnant with our second son, Cairo, before I did. So she was trying to surprise me. She didn't tell me that she was pregnant. But while she had also, while she was pregnant, she also told me she wanted to get in the best shape of her life going into the new year. So I was trying to hold her accountable and she, was, she wasn't working out. I didn't know she was in her first trimester. Right. And she didn't tell me because she wanted to surprise me. For the new year, I wanted it to be like yeah. a, oh, you know, so the announcement. <laughs> I'm like, yo, you said you want to get in the best shape of your life. We got to do this together. And he kept procrastinating, procrastinating. And then one day I just lost. I said, you know what your problem is? You just fucking lazy. You fucking lazy. If you want to be great, you got to be great. Just like the guys on YouTube. You got to wake up at 4 a.m. Yeah. You got to do this in a minute fasting. And she was like, I'm not fucking lazy to I'm fucking crazy. <laughs> and I'm like, well, why didn't you lead with that? Yeah, yeah why did you say <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know what to say. I was like, Bro, it was literally 
literally like a couple days shy of the new year and I'm like trying to think of a new uh. way because prior to this, we had Jackson, our oldest. There were five years in between and I was having trouble getting pregnant. Like I knew something was wrong. I had to have a special procedure done. So it was like a big deal for me to be like, but yeah. I was also battling like the worst morning sickness at the time because I was trying to hold out and it was just awful. <laughs> awful. <Dang>. I mean, <laughs> we can relate on so many things now. The amount of yeah. times... The accountability side of it, like you said, it's like it's such a fine balance between trying to balance the like former athlete side and like yeah. the marriage side because Kitty and I'm really similar with you when you're saying um like if you don't feel like you have that choice, when he mm -hmm. starts to become my coach, Bro. I shut down. Because oh, I'm like, sure. dude, I had a coach for 25 years. Don't tell me what to do. I will choose it on my own. She's like, you're being really controlling. I'm like, what the, what do you, you said you wanted to work out three days a week. What do you want? Thank you. <laughs> but I actually want to sleep in today. So get off my back. Okay. Uh, um, no. But it's the communication. We have a play date after this. We have to have a play date. Please. Please. <laughs> Our one-year-olds can run wild together. Yeah. Yes, nice. absolutely. But it is that communication is so hard to figure out, especially like, Kind of like you guys were saying, coming from a perfectionist and then a former athlete, like the aggressive side and like trying to figure out how to support each other. It's mm -hmm. it takes so long to figure out. And we're still in the middle of it. I mean, we have a one year old and a three year old and we don't sleep ever. So we're always at each other's throats. But it's it's a wild adventure. But I'm also like. I'm like, we've been married almost seven years now. I'm like, Sean, you, I got a resume. I got a track record. Like, you can't just all of a sudden think I'm I'm going to turn into this controlling guy because I asked you to. But, forget. Yeah, I'm like, you know, my reputation should speak for itself now at this no. point. You it know? doesn't. But it doesn't. <laughs> no. You're like, yeah, it should, but no, it doesn't. Uh, we, we, we had a, a conversation because we don't even scream and argue like that anymore. Like, once you get to 12 years, you're like, the screaming and arguing don't matter. <laughs> I don't feel like doing this and I want to have sex later. So we're not going to have that. We don't have the energy so, at all. But I did tell her, I said, Kay, okay, you know what bothers me? You'll tell me, for example, you want to work out three times a week. So I'll say, <laughs> yes, let's go. Let's set a plan. She goes, uh-uh. I want to work out three times a week when I want to work out. Dude, exactly. Oh, my God. Exactly. And I'm like, That's, there's no accountability there. She's like, I don't need accountability. I just need you to cheer me on yes. when I'm going to the gym and then tell me I look good after the gym. <laughs> Absolutely. And tell me you're proud of me. That's yeah. it. Tell me you're That's proud it. of me. Exactly. So like, and, squat, uh, and, and spot me on the rack if I, you know, try to be ambitious and squat again, which I started doing. So Dang, let's go. Hey. She's getting after it. That's, my mentality is like, Sean will be like, I want to I wanna have a like women's group once a week i'm like let's put it on the calendar let's send out the text we're gonna whoa, be 7 p.m every wednesday night let's lock and she's like she's like whoa whoa back off anyway let me do this on my terms but um i do something i really appreciate though you guys saying i'll never forget this when i was when we got engaged i was going on a walk with a friend and i was like okay and they'd been married she had been married already for like five years i was like okay prepare me what is marriage like what are we going to argue about? Or like, I was truly trying to prepare for it. And she goes, Oh, me and my husband don't fight. I don't think we've ever had an argument. And I was like, wow. Uh, okay. But wow. similar to you guys, we talk about everything, every like thing that has happened, will happen preparation, yeah. how I felt, how you made me feel. What are you yeah. thinking? What do you do? All these things. And we almost cause arguments very consistently but i think it's great because we end up knowing so much about each other absolutely that it makes it absolutely. so much easier no absolutely look i i agree with that notion of almost causing arguments because realistically it's not an argument it's more of a debate and it's more of a clash of ideas right yeah. how do you learn about someone else unless they challenge your thought right if you get into a mindset of my thought is the only thought that matters and i'm the correct thought then you become egotistical, right? Self-centered. And then you also make yourself dumber because you refuse to listen to other people's thoughts. So we both learned how to not uh, deflect our partner's feelings, right? So if I say something and she says, that hurt my feelings, I've learned to not say, well, you shouldn't, your feelings shouldn't be hurt because that's not how I meant it. You can't do that. You have to accept the fact that, hey, I hurt your feelings. I'm not going to keep telling you why your feelings shouldn't be hurt. 
I'm going to accept the fact that your feelings are hurt. Can you at least listen to what I was saying then? And we've learned to navigate that space both sides. Because as a man, my feelings be hurt too, sweetheart. <laughs> okay, don't, don't tell me that I shouldn't have hurt feelings. It was one time we, we talked about this in the book. She told me she wanted me to be more vulnerable. So I started to be more vulnerable telling her how I feel. Then she got tired of that because I kept telling her how I felt. And she kept saying, you know what? You sound like a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. How am a bitch now? To be vulnerable? You don't want to tell me to be vulnerable. Listen, I can only take it in doses, though. Like, Denial has left out the simple fact that he was captain of the debate team. So sometimes having a disagreement with him or trying to hash things out becomes an exhausting exercise. It's like an extreme sport sometimes. I can see Andrew's the same way. He's the same way. <laughs> he, some, oh my gosh. The amount of it's times, time for my rebuttal on, now. Are you done? It's time for my rebuttal. No. Give me the stage. No. Put me on the mic. It's <laughs> let's go. No, I'm not even kidding. There have been there have been so many times where we will get in long, long, long debates and like close to arguments. But he'll be debating something he doesn't even believe in because he just wants to debate the other side. Big devil's advocate. And at the end guy. of it, he'll be like, right. "Oh no, no, I totally agreed with you the whole time." I was like. What are you doing? <laughs> He's trying, He's trying to expand your mind. Just think about it. <laughs> Devil's uh, advocate. I do the same thing. Dude. I, I do the same thing. So, I, but Andrew, ain't it like a great? It's like a great mental exercise. Hundred percent. Right? Like one of my friends called me on it because I was debating that Michael Jordan is the goat, and my boy says, "Wait a minute! <laughs> you were yelling at me that LeBron James is the goat." <laughs> I'm with you right now. I'm with you. And then he was like, oh, this is some bullshit. Like, You're getting upset. You're being emotional. Yeah. I, can't. Uh, I need you to come with some facts uh, and some facts. If you don't have stats and facts, don't debate with me, sir. Uh, like, oh, man. Um, do you remember that 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 uh, commercial with, uh, what was it? It was Old Spice. Yes. When it was like, way too much cologne wearer. Yeah. Think the Val is the way too much receipt puller outer yeah. because the Val is the first to pull out a receipt and be like, Well, you said on October 4th, words have power, facts, I mean, words have power. Like, what are we- <laughs> that? The Val, like. It's like it's like now I have to like train my brain when we have like a discussion or a disagreement or anything to like okay I have to listen to all of his points so I know what points I'll then have to re- have a rebuttal to. That's the whole point. And I have to remember it at the same time while listening to him because I'm You're genuinely welcome. trying to understand him, and it literally has become an extreme sport having a discussion. You with just him. became a more efficient human, Bro. Yeah. <laughs> like. <laughs> Sean will be like, it hurts my feelings when you when you bring up the exact thing that I said earlier. I'm like, I'm like, what? My mind, I can't understand this. Doesn't make any sense. No. And then I'll throw it back and I'll be like, what? Are you gonna bring up this sentence that I said in a year and like use it against me? Probably because you said it. But yes, you said it. Don't say it. Well, you gotta. Say. I was trying but to listen, express how I feel. Okay. Listen, but but we've learned that feelings are not connected to words. Feelings are just feelings. And when you can at least validate your partner's feelings, even if y'all don't agree, it makes the argument go away and we can still have a conversation. Mm-hmm. It took us a long time to, to deal with that. Mm-hmm. Because just like you, Drew, when she would say the same thing to me, it hurts my feelings when you just bring up stuff that I said, <laughs> then then I would just be like, that sounds dumb. <laughs> you can't insult, but you can't insult the person you love and, and in the moment, I didn't think I was insulting her. I was being honest. I was like, hey, how are you going to get upset at me for reminding you what you said? <laughs> and, and she was like, I don't give a shit. Girl. <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel that. Like, why do I have to be so deadlocked on the feelings in that moment? Uh-huh. Maybe it's to change my mind. Maybe I grew up. And you're allowed to change your mind. Yes. You're allowed to, and I, I like when you change your mind. Thank you. Know? you. So just remind, remember that you changed it. So then when we start debating, remember which side of your mind you on that day. Yep. So I can debate with that. You know, do you uh, so how long been, you're 140 something episodes in your podcast? Is that right? Yeah, something like that. We just started recording Episode season 10. season 10. Dang, we just started, yeah, yeah, 141. Do you well? I love doing this with Sean because, like, we would we have conversations here we ne- otherwise never would. Also, we would not be talking to you two if we didn't have a podcast, mm-hmm. and it's so much fun. But do you have a do you like YouTube, like the vlog vibe, or the podcast scene better? 
that's a good one. I particularly, I like the podcast because it's very just low maintenance for me. It's it's per- typically what we do on a day-to-day basis, but it also gives an added layer to people who follow us on, for example, Instagram or YouTube, where they get to kind of get almost like a behind the scenes or like a rehash of why we, for example, put a video out, or if there's like an extended lesson in something that we, we had in an episode with the boys on YouTube that we can like talk more about at length. Um, and I also like it because Deval and I joke about our podcast being a form of therapy for us, but it legitimately is. So I feel yeah. like I usually walk away from conversations with him, even conversations when we're guests on other shows, like I'll learn something new about him or learn something new that we can like take from you guys and say, oh my God, or right. we don't feel crazy because I'm like, well, Sean and Drew are the same way because they <laughs> said on the podcast that, you know, so it doesn't she's, make you feel crazy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so the podcast space for that reason and it's super easy to just sit at home and we're in the comfort of our home which is nice now and you know we get to do our thing and then keep it pushing so i would have to say i like the podcast too because i feel like the world with instagram and twitter and facebook has become so aesthetically driven right everybody wants to see perfection everybody just wants to see that no one actually listened you know uh for example we put up a flyer that we're going on tour the first question in all of the comments is what are the tour dates did you even read the, like did you read the caption <laughs> yeah. at all? People yeah. people just are so programmed now to look at something and then respond to what they mm-hmm. looked at. I feel like when you have a podcast, people are forced to listen. You know, you, you put on your, your headphones, you listen to people speak, you get an in more in-depth idea of who we are mm-hmm. by listening to us as opposed to just watching us. You know, um a shout out to my wife, she's very distracting because she's fine as hell. And we do these, we do these vlogs, you know, we do these vlogs and people don't be listening to what we're saying on the vlogs. They just or, be looking at my wife. Or what they want to do, <laughs> what they want to do sometimes is like take a little clip of a conversation or something and then take that and then run with it. And it's like, bro, you didn't even listen to the entire episode, like the monogamy episode that we had yeah. that went viral and people were getting on us. Some people were like team Deval, some were team Kadeem. Some people thought we needed to be divorced. Yeah. Like, there were so many opinions floating around because people only heard a small snippet of maybe 30 seconds when there was an entire hour long episode about how we even arrived at getting to that point. Um, so it's, it's nice to have the podcast as a way to kind of back up the things that we've said or the things that have like people have taken and run with on social media. Have y'all heard the monogamy episode or seen the clip? Yeah. Give us a synopsis of, of what went down there. Just so ultimately what happened was Kadeen and I have been together since we're 18. And when we were in college, we had sex maybe like three, four times a day. Sometimes like it was, you know, it's college. Like you 18 is new. It's like, ah, <laughs> so as we got older, life starts happening. We get married. Uh, even when we were engaged, Things slow down. They're, you know, her body was changing. She was on birth control. She had babies at one point. And we had went through a period where intimacy was at an all-time low. And we couldn't figure it out. So me being the accountability person was just like, what's wrong with me? Like, why is my wife not into me? So I'm doing all these things to try to figure out what it is. And then I got to a point where I was like, it's, it's not me. It has to be you. And... I'd be coming on to her, coming on to her, and they'd be telling she's like, I'm not in the mood, or she's like, I'm tired. Or she would promise, well, she never does that, I'm not in the mood. She would promise me early in the day, like, yo, tonight, I'm going. Rah, 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 rah. Then the nighttime come around and she would go to sleep. And in the, in, the, in the episode, I said, you know, I think it's unfair for you as a woman to demand monogamy from me. And she was like, wait, I demanded monogamy? And I was just like, you wanted to be exclusive, correct? And she was like, you didn't want to be exclusive. And I was like, I never said I didn't want to be exclusive. But you definitely told me that if I wasn't only with you, then we couldn't be together. And first of all, when I said that, people were just like, oh, he don't want to be where he want to be with other women. But that wasn't my point. My point was, if you're going to demand monogamy from me, and the one thing you don't want me to do is be with anybody else. When I come to you, why do you make it seem like it's a chore when I come to you for the one thing that you don't want me to share with anybody else. And I said that it's not fair. It's not fair for you to ask me to share only myself with you. And then when I try, you make me feel guilty for it. Mm-hmm. And, and then, then I said, um, I think part of the conversation that was in that clip too was me saying that, that like he felt like I pressured him into yeah. getting married or pressured him to proposing. And I said, it wasn't me trying to put pressure on you. It was me saying, we've been dating for eight years. 
at what point are we going to take this to the next level? Because I don't knew that I wanted to be mm. with him for the rest of my life. He was going to be the father of my children. All of that was already in my mind. But to, in my mind, I'm also like looking at this list of things I had to do by a certain age. And I was like, okay, I'm rolling on my late 20s. Like, if this is going to be my guy, when are we going to get married so we can have these kids? Cause, and and then people really ran with that too. They ran they with- like, oh, she, she pressured him into being yeah. married. And, you know, that the was guys- a debate. The guy said that she weaponized her vagina by pressuring me into monogamy. And then when she got me to commit, cutting off the vagina and saying, you can only get it when I want it. And then all the women were saying that I was an egotistical, uh, narcissistic maniac that only wanted my wife for sex. And based on the clip that they heard without context, that's what it sounded like. But what we ended up discussing it throughout the whole episode was how She and I were never prepared for what monogamy actually looked like. We watched a bunch of Disney movies and felt like, oh, once you get married, everything's going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. No men ever told me that once your woman had, once your child, your your baby's mom has babies, her body is going to physiologically change. Her sex drive is going to go down. She may not feel as sexy because she's gained weight. If she gets on birth control, that may affect her libido. No one told me that as a man. So all this time, I'm saying to myself, what's wrong with me? We didn't realize that it was everything we were doing to her body that changed the way she viewed sex. No women were telling her, like, listen, that man that you see with a bunch of different women who get sex whenever he wants, the minute you ask him not to have sex with everybody else, his sex drive is still going to be as high. And if you want him to be with you, you have to put the work in to make sure that he's okay. It's like no one told us to be focused on our partners when it came to right. intimacy. It's very, very we just thought we had to be focused self. on ourselves. Mm-hmm. And throughout the episode, we talked about all of the myths that we busted during that time and mm-hmm. how we got our intimacy back and how we were able to grow and how sex is better than ever now. But they didn't get to that part. Yeah. They only saw the 30 second clip. And then, you know, just went crazy on Twitter. I got canceled on Twitter. I'm not even on Twitter. They canceled me on Twitter. All the women, black Twitter canceled me on Twitter. And then all the men was just like, she wrong. She wanted him for his money and all this other stuff. Little did they know we were together. She's I was 18. like, what money? It's a meal card. I got to skip it. What's up? But, um, yeah, it was just that, that yeah. monogamy episode was, uh, it was a big, deal, it was a big deal for a lot of people. But to us, it was just a typical marriage conversation. Yeah. Well, and... I I understand how it's like people run with it because if you talk about anything real anymore, people just run with it and they're like, oh, you yeah. can't talk about this. But that's mm-hmm. it's amazing that that's actually a conversation you guys had because that's something you have to work on in marriage. Yeah. And most people would either just like not talk about it and things would get so drastically worse and then you end up building a wedge between like each yeah. other. And I think it's really yeah. good. We've had the same conversations. Oh. We've we've uh, no go ahead Drew go ahead Drew. I, well, I was just I, thinking I, it, it, sex is such an interesting like uh, object that that I think reveals a lot about a relationship and where it's at because it's like well it's such a fragile thing like if if there's disharmony or disagreement like you're not necessarily having sex but I remember our premarital counselor told us that like hey there's gonna be some times where. Uh, Sean's not feeling like having sex, but it's an act of service and it's selfless for her to like engage in that and vice versa too. Like sometimes I'm like, I'm like, you know, I need a little, little bit of time to reload, you know, between, but, and I'm like, I I don't got it right now, babe. It's, and like that can hurt her feelings too. But then it's like, it is this really cool process of supporting each other and like, Hey, I can't give this to you right now or, or. I want to, but I can't. And let's have like a, let's still be intimate, even though we're not having sex. Like we could really get to know each other better, mm-hmm. you know? No, I, I, I agree with you. And I feel like if more people had these conversations, when people decide to fully engage in monogamy, they will be caught off guard. Mm-hmm. You know, like we have four boys. I am going to speak to my sons and say, listen, if you choose monogamy, the first thing you have to understand is that your girlfriend or your wife may not always be in the mood when you're in the mood. And I say that because there have been women who wrote into us who said, mm-hmm. in my relationship, I'm devout and my oh, husband's yeah. Kadeem. Like, mm-hmm. they, and, they, they, and this is the crazy part. When the monogamy episode came out, a lot of women were bashing me. A lot of men were bashing Kadeem. But there were women who were saying like, yo, I be in the mood and my man don't be in the mood. And I feel less than a woman mm-hmm. when my man 
is not ready for me. And I heard women say, yeah, I get that. So I'm like, wait a minute. So when you want to have sex and he don't want to have sex and you're upset about it, that's okay. Mm -hmm. But when I as a man want to have sex and she don't want to have sex and I'm upset about it, that's wrong. Make it make sense. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I started to realize that people started to serve their genders more than they serve their marriage. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what we realize is that we can't serve our gender within our marriage. We have to serve the other person. That's how we came up with the, the title, We Over Me. Every decision we make in this house has to be a decision for both of us mm -hmm. and our children. I can no longer make a decision for just a vow. When I made these vows to this woman, I can no longer at this point say, I'm doing this just for me. If I'm going to do that, I shouldn't be married and vice versa. And when we started doing that, our marriage just, the crazy thing, our marriage started to blossom. Financially, we started to blossom. But sexually, it's been like on a whole different level because I started to get more in tune with her body. I started to understand how the women's reproductive system worked. I understood how that's I still how don't understand how that works, bro. I got no, I, I don't know. <laughs> well, I got, you're, 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 you're 31. <laughs> you're 31. When I was 31, I had no clue. <laughs> no clue. You well, had two kids, okay? I'm like, you nah, got to figure you it out. Tell at me some when, point. and I'm ready. Oh, yeah. Clearly, you're doing something right. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you, first of all, you bagged you a nice one. You know, yeah. <laughs> so you're doing something right. You clearly know something about the reproductive system because you got two kids. Uh, but um, when Kadeem, we almost lost Kadeem with having Jackson. You know, she almost died at, at childbirth. She her cervix was lacerated. She had to get emergency surgery. So that was the first instance where I said I have to be more involved with yeah. her reproductive health. Mm -hmm. And um, when we had Cairo, he was almost born in the car because we were driving there trying to get there because we didn't want to do epidural anymore we didn't want to do any medication mm -hmm. the so black like, nissan maxima with the with the subs in the back not the at, at this point what we were we doing have? okay 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 <laughs> i had an audi i had an audi a7 yeah, oh, yeah, nice, nice, nice. imagine having a baby on them seats she, <laughs> she's in the car like this grabbing my neck talking about baby is gonna come out i'm so sorry the seats the seats gonna get messed up and i'm like okay stop worrying leather. about the oh, seats you'll Lord. be you'll be fine <laughs> Dang. But um, with every yeah. child, we had two home. We had two home births. Yeah, our last two were at home, which was amazing. Yeah, we had them in a tub. So things would be happening to my body at Deval. It's like he almost. I knew it's it. almost like he saw it. He it. was so proactive when it came to me and my body and like things that I needed. Yeah. Like he'd come home with like vitamins and like you should drink this and that. And I'm just like, I'm, for what? And he's like, I read up on this and that. And I'm like, Aww. all right, I mean, go ahead then. I'll I read. Switch. I have a whole bunch of literature in my in upstairs which is from doctors, which is from pediatricians, which is from gynecologists, because I didn't want to just look up on YouTube because you don't know what you can trust on YouTube. So I just gathered a bunch of literature from actual physicians about what to focus on with women's reproductive health. But then I also learned like, yo, if her pH balance is off, if, if her hormones are off, her libido is the first thing to go. Mm -hmm. That's how I ended up getting a vasectomy because I realized she was on birth control for close to 20 years, we were together. And I was like, wait a minute. When we first got together, she wasn't on birth control. We were having sex nonstop. She gets on birth control and slowly over time, and that's when I learned both birth control doesn't only stop semen from penetrating the egg. It also stops the libido from you wanting to have as much sex. Yeah, hormones are like... So I was, th I was like, yo... So how have things been since a vasectomy? What's up? How have things been since a vasectomy? Oh, <laughs> so this, is, so this, this is the funny thing, right? The vasectomy, at least from my perspective, seemed like it was a piece of cake. Okay, no, it, it was. It was a piece of cake. Like, like, bro, you an athlete. Let me tell you something. Drew. Let me, Here let me goes tell the, you. the relation to athletics. Let me tell you something. All the all the regular pedestrians, right? They'll get a vasectomy. They'll be out two weeks. They're gonna milk it. Oh. <laughs> I had a vasectomy on Thursday. I was no ready to have sex on Sunday. Back in action. <laughs> oh, like, aren't you still in recovery? Like, nah. I was hoping to buy myself at least a good week or two. Nah, we got to test this out. Because um, <laughs> I told the doctor, I asked him, I said, hey, is my nut going to be the same? And he was like, what you mean? I was like, the consistency. Like, I can't have a watery nut. Like, it's just, I don't want her to look at my nut now and be like, oh. And? Like, it's, oh it's, God. it's different. It's exactly the same. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's so funny because we looked at the calendar this morning and we're like oh shoot we have sean and drew, and drew this morning so um we were supposed to go back to the urologist yeah. to take his sample in 
to just get doubly checked to make sure that yeah. there's nothing still swimming. So, but, but how I'm fresh? Gonna, how fresh out the game are you? Oh, I just had it done October 13th. Okay, okay. October 13th. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm just fresh out the game after we had. So here's another story about being of service. After we had Dakota, we had a plan on having a fifth baby. Uh, we was like, yo, we can do this. We have a fifth baby. But she ended up suffering from postpartum preeclampsia. So oh, the doctor told us, like, listen, uh, and once again, she almost had a stroke. Her blood pressure was like 200 over 120. Yeah, it was crazy. It was something crazy. And the doctor said, lucky you brought her in because if she would have mm-hmm. did like most women do, which is go to sleep because they have a headache, yeah. I could have woke up the next morning and my wife would just be there. Yeah. And I was like, babe, Dang. like, no, like, we have to figure out how to make you healthy. Like, we have to figure this out. So the doctor, First thing was that. The doctor was like, listen, you, you have to try. I don't think you should have another baby. Because mm-hmm. if you have another baby, you're going to have full-blown preeclampsia yeah, throughout the your pregnancy. Yeah, the chances are higher mm-hmm. when you have it that time around. And also, too, I had the IUD in at this point. I was losing so much blood every month. It was just a mess. And I was like, I need to get my body off of it. I was borderline anemic. I'm like, it's your turn. And, and your I'm turn. not going to sit here and be like, I was like, yes, vasectomy, I'm a man. No, I was like, really? You really want me to snip? I, don't, I can't do that. But... Thinking about her reproductive health and even just her life yeah. was more like, all right, let me go and do this. The crazy thing is the minute she took that IUD out, it was like a different mm-hmm. fucking life. Like before it used to be, we would have sex on a Monday. I knew, and this may be a little bit too much information, but <laughs> this is <laughs> how this is how she used to be of service to me and I used to be of service to her. We'd have sex on a Monday. I knew we weren't going to have sex two days in a row because she wasn't in the mood. Tuesday, she gave me head. Wednesday would be a day off, but Thursday she's like, I'm ready. <laughs> so Thursday we'd have sex again. Friday she'd be like, talk about a schedule, morning. right, Sean? So, it's like this. So is you got lower happen. body day, upper body day, exactly. <laughs> Wednesday is off day. Day. You, know, you know how it goes. <laughs> but she took the IUD out. Monday comes around, we have sex. Now I'm prepared on Tuesday to be like, yo, you don't gotta have no sex. She got on shorts and a. <laughs> Top and, and she put the kids in bed. It's I'm like, like yo. Uniform. I'm like, what are you? What, what's up? What's up? She's like, what's up? You tell me what's up. So I'm like, oh. <laughs> we going for two days in a row, and then Maybe. it just seemed like her libido just started to naturally grow yeah. more. It's and amazing how the body just like when you rid it of anything that's just the wo- outside of it. A woman's it body is the most sensitive. Like, I, like think about it. You create humans with this body. You create humans. It should be taken care of. And this is why, this is another thing I spoke to her uh, gynecologist, not gynecologist, uh, your midwife. My midwife, yeah. When they talked about women being promiscuous and they talk about women just having sex, the sexual revolution where the women can do the same thing a man can do. She said to me, oh, she said, Deval, a woman can never do the same thing a man can do. She said, there's so much things that happen to a woman's body every time they have intercourse. Whereas with a man, nothing literally happens. She was like the amount of bacteria. And, and she made it clear to me that even when I want to have sex all the time, I'm putting my wife at risk for infection, for bacteria infection, for so many different things. So it just made me more cognizant of the fact that I have to take care of this instrument if I wanted to perform when I wanted to perform. So the more I did that, the more she fell in love with that. And then now it's like, we're closer Instrument to perform. That's it's incredible. like that Audi A7. You gotta, you gotta treat it. You gotta give it the premium food, the whole you thing, man. You gotta, yeah, yeah. You gotta just, put premium gas. It's that <laughs> exactly. You gotta put no regular gas. Yeah. Down the leather seat. Get it. <laughs> oh, I get the oil. I, I get the oil. I'll be oiling down the seats. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, the De, Deval, Kadeen, thank you for the time. All right, for those listening, I'm just going to do a list off here. We got yeah. the podcast, Dead Ass Check Out. If you want to hear more of, of these two, hilarious. Would highly recommend you check that out. They're also on a podcast tour. We'll link that. Their book, We Over Me, is on shelves February 7th. We're going to link that. Congratulations on that. And then we got Instagrams and all the socials. So and check their merch. Out. The merch. the merch. Check out the merch. We got merch. merch. We're on Patreon for extended content. We're yeah, you can view you can view the full episodes of the mm-hmm. podcast and the behind the scenes and the live shows on our Patreon. We also have the travel show coming out with the children in February. Yeah, what you network know, is that on? Uh, GoUSA.com. Go yeah, that's so amazing. Travel show we can play. You guys are so. busy. That's amazing. Yeah. Always busy. Always busy. We're not always, having no more kids blessed. though. <laughs> <laughs> that part too. Well, yeah. <laughs> we'll keep lighting it up as you always have. And uh, 
I want to buy you dinner in Nashville or Atlanta at some point. I feel like yes. we would get along. Have, I'm have with a, it. Yeah. Let's I'm with it because I know Nashville makes good barbecue, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. one thing you know for. So Nashville makes good barbecue. Oh, we sure. appreciate We're y'all. We y'all up for sure. For uh, allowing us to utilize your platform. You guys are amazing. Sure. Uh, we love y'all. To, to see you guys doing this at your your age, like you're still babies, really. You know what I'm saying? Like 31. And to have this level of communication and vulnerability and just be such a light for people who want to be married, man. It means a lot. Like yeah. at 31, we didn't have it figured out. No. You know, we were trying, we were struggling, but to see you guys like this makes us feel great. Like yeah. I, I'm smiling on the inside. I love love. I do love love, man. Yeah. I do. And I'm a still, that light y'all got in the back. Yeah, I'm a still, we got to get a light. light. Well, I do, I yeah, you got to figure out the lighting situation. I'm not going to lie. And I hate, I, I know you just got that Mario Kart shirt, but I think you sweat through it already, bro. Like you already got the, there, oh my gosh, look at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going all in on this interview, okay? I'm putting in the work. I'm putting in the work. Oh, man. Well, no, I love it. I think we're sharing the same type of message. So uh, glad I to be doing that. it together. But thank you guys. Yes. No doubt. Appreciate sure. you. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Thank you.